Okay, thanks so much, Julia, and uh, to Simon's Foundation and Safari for the opportunity and the invitation to be here tonight to tell you about um, just our, some of our work. So, you know, it's been long known that the nervous system and the immune system interact um, in multiple levels, mostly in the context of disease or injury. When the blood-brain barrier is breached, you know that you can have interactions between these two systems. But I think over the last decade or so, it's become increasingly clear that there's actually a lot of interactions between the immune system and the nervous system, even in the healthy brain. And we now appreciate that a number of molecules traditionally associated with the adaptive and the innate immune system are actually expressed in the healthy brain by neurons, by glial cells all the time. And in particular, they play a, um, a more robustly expressed, uh, in some of these at least, during development when the brain is wired up. Um, so today I want to tell you a bit about um, sort of how we got into all this. And I'm going to focus uh, my attention uh, on this cell here, microglia, our resident immune cells. And until recently, much of what we knew about these cells was in the context of disease and injury. Um, and, and what I'm going to tell you about today is that these cells um, play a really important role during development. They help sculpt developing neural circuits and synaptic circuits. And I'd like to tell you a bit about what we know about them, how they do this in the normal development uh, of a mouse visual system, which is the model that we've been using. And then in part two, I want to segue into new research that suggests that this immune-related pruning pathway we've been studying could become aberrantly activated or dysregulated in the developing brain. And this may be important and, and play a role in neuropsychiatric disorders like schizophrenia and, and potentially autism. Okay, so let's just start with, with this image, which I always like to start with Cajal, right? So the wiring diagram of the brain is remarkably complex, as illustrated by this beautiful image. Um, the human brain contains 100 billion neurons, trillions of synapses, yet somehow each neuron manages to find the right connection with the right cell. They re receive thousands of these connections to form functional circuits that control specific behaviors. It's really mind-boggling, right? However, uh, despite how beautifully precise the circuit looks, we're not born with such precision. Actually, we start out with a bit messier uh, circuitry. So neural circuits undergo a tremendous degree of remodeling during development. Um, synaptic connections, the connections between neurons constantly form and break. Um, and actually, it's this refinement or sculpting process that I'm going to be talking about today. It's why a child's brain is so plastic, why my daughter, for example, who's, who's six years old, can learn French seamlessly, where I, as an adult, cannot. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, really different features about the developing brain, and this idea of plasticity, how, is that, how does that come about? Well, we know, uh, if you look at this diagram, that initially um, there's an excess of synaptic connections. This is a, a diagram uh, taken from Hutton Locher's uh, work that just illustrates that if you were to look through development at different times and places in the brain, you see that initially this, um, this wiring diagram is such that there's an excess of synaptic connections, and then through a process called developmental pruning or synapse elimination, a large number of these extra connections get permanently removed through a process called pruning. Now, it's known that this process is a good thing during development. You want to prune some of your synapses, right? This is the way that um, we, sort of the idea of use it or lose it. Connections that are meaningful to us get strengthened and maintained, and those that are less meaningful get eliminated. And so we also know that it's necessary for precise brain wiring and connectivity. And it's thought that defects in this pruning process or refinement process could underlie neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disorders. So one of the major questions that we've been focused on for the last many years in my lab is this question of how is it that synapses get eliminated? Because what we now appreciate, mostly from the work in animal models, is that this is an incredibly precise process. Not all synapses are randomly pruned. Specific synapses get pruned. And so it is illustrated by this cartoon. You can see this neuron, this postsynaptic neuron, is innervated by red and blue inputs. These are the axons coming in and making synapses onto those cells. And initially, you'll see lots of inputs. And over the course of development, you can start to see that some of these inputs, like the blue ones, get removed. But the red ones remain, some of them. And some of them even get stronger. So the question is, how does this work? One of the things we know that regulates this process of pruning is neuronal activity. It's known that activity sets up a local competition in such a way that the input, in this case the red one, that's able to more efficiently fire the postsynaptic cell, wins this local competition at the expense of its nearby neighbor, in this case the blue one. 
So we've known this for many years. This is true in the peripheral nervous system, which has been beautifully studied in our muscular junction. We know it's true in many parts of the brain, especially sensory systems like the visual system where it's been well established. But the question we've been thinking a lot about is what are the molecules or what are the mechanisms that distinguish the red from the blue input? Could there be molecular tags, if you will, that say, okay, eliminate the blue one but not the red one? Could there be protective signals that protect certain inputs from being removed? And, and also, where do they go? Do the neurons retract them and take them in? Or are there other ways by which these synaptic connections get pruned? Now, much of the field, with good reason, has focused on mechanisms regulated by neurons themselves. Intrinsic mechanisms are signals that are regulated in neurons. And not surprisingly, these are the cells that are getting pruned. That makes sense. But emerging evidence implicate glial cells in this process of pruning. Now, glia, as, as you just heard from Julia, they make up the other half of the brain, roughly. Um, they are a, a number of different cells, oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and, and microglia in the central nervous system make up over half the cells of our brain. And we now know from the work of many in the field, including work from Von Barris's lab, my, my, my mentor, and many, many others now, that the glial cells are actively communicating with neurons and synapses. And one of the jobs they do during development, one of the many jobs they do, is they help to sculpt synapses and help to regulate their formation, their plasticity, and, and their elimination. Today I want to focus on, uh, uh, although astrocytes have been quite, quite well studied in this context of, of synapse formation, I'm going to focus on this guy over here, microglia. And I just say that as a developmental neurobiologist and a card-carrying glial biologist, I've completely ignored these cells until about the last 10 years or so. And that's in large part because, as a developmental neurobiologist, they really weren't thought to sort of be there early enough to be playing such a big important role in development. But we now appreciate that these cells actually enter the brain extremely early in development, embryonic development. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about microglia to sort of set the, set the tone here. So first of all, it was drawn in this diagram as this sort of immune-looking cell. And of course, they are our resident immune cells. But they're actually quite beautiful. They have lots of processes, as you can see here. They tile the brain. They make up about 7 to 10 percent of the cells of our brain, give or take. And one of the things I'd say the first game changer for me was, um, was, a, was a really beautiful and important fate mapping study done by Mary Murad's lab and Florent Genou, where they basically asked the question, where do these cells come from? And where do they, how do they get into the brain? And when do they get in the brain? And this was a paper that basically showed that it, despite the way it's always been thought, the dogma was that they come in through the peripheral nervous system, through the peripheral immune system, the circulating macrophages sneak in after birth, and they basically become microglia. So that's suggesting a sort of later step. We now know that they come from the yolk sac. They're a special progenitor of tissue-derived macrophages that go into the brain in a mouse as early as embryonic day eight. Right? So that says that these are the first glial cells in the brain. They're there before any of the other cell types. In fact, they're there when tons of major developmental milestones are happening. Neurogenesis, migration, pathfinding, when all of the layers are being formed, microglia are there. And I would say that nothing's still known about how they potentially regulate any of that. So they're there early. Now, we do know a lot about these cells because they are well known for their roles in injury and disease. So there are resident immune cells, meaning they do have similarities to their counterparts in the immune system, macrophages. Um, we know that they have both good, bad, good and bad roles in the brain in the context of disease. We know that they um, undergo dramatic changes in morphology. They go from this sort of fine sort of processy, uh, sort of uh, very beautiful looking cell to this what I would call an angry looking cell. They pull their processes in. They become more phagocytic, meaning that they are capable of engulfing things more. They express different markers. We know that they're good guys and bad guys, meaning that they can certainly promote and, and regulate neuroinflammation in the brain. They release a lot of things like cytokines and inflammatory molecules that could be harmful. They also can do a lot of good things. Um, these are sort of one of their homeostatic roles. They can clear debris, apoptotic cells, and pathogens like bacteria. And they're really good at removing toxic proteins. And this has been really well shown in, in Alzheimer's disease, for example, where they're really good at clearing amyloid beta plaques. So this is just to give you a picture of their sort of good roles and bad role, but again, in the context of disease. One of the things, unlike any other cell in the brain, that they're incredibly good at doing, and it's not to say no other cell can be phagocytic, but they're incredibly good at eating things, engulfing things. And this is illustrated here by a movie that was taken by my colleague Axel Nimron, 
uh, where uh, in vivo imaging studies reveal that if you look in the cerebellum of a mouse, this is a Purkinje cell shown here in red. This is a microglial cell hanging out next to it, associating with it. And what Axel did in this experiment is he damaged the Purkinje cell purposely and then asked what do the microglia do in response to that injury. And what you could hopefully appreciate is them literally pulling up and eating bits of that neuron, right? And actually, we now know from others that they can even engulf things that aren't undergoing apoptosis, like during early development. They can actually eat a, a live cell, a live neuron, right? So they, they are really good at eating cells and debris. So this we knew. But one of the things that we can now appreciate, because of tools that are now available to us in the field, is that we have these reporter lines, right? These microglia reporter lines using this fractal kind receptor EGFP mouse. So all of the microglia are labeled green, fluorescent. Um, this was a mouse developed by Stefan Young. And using this mouse, it enabled scientists to look into the brains of mice and ask, what are these cells doing in different contexts? And these are some pioneers. Uh, some of, uh, some of the, uh, these folks, including Wen Biao and, and, and Demetrius, were here at NYU and made these discoveries. Axel Nimron was the other. And what they showed is when you actually looked in the brains of a mouse and said, OK, what are these microglia doing? They demonstrated that they're incredibly dynamic cells, all right? They can respond dramatically to injury, not just by eating things, but their processes move. They can chemo-attract towards the sites of injury. This is illustrated in this movie, where again, using a uh, putting a, 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 a mouse under the scope, watching microglia, that was an example of a local injury, and literally the microglia processes recruit towards the site of injury very, very uh, robustly. Now that's in the damage uh, case, and we've a lot of people have been focused on that. But one of the things that I became very interested in is this other observation, which is even without injury, if you just watch them, what we now appreciate is that they're always dynamic. Their processes are always moving. They're constantly surveying the brain, parenchyma, all the time. And it's a, one of the unique features of these cells. No other cell that I know of does this. And this raises a number of questions that became of interest to me, which is, what is it that they're surveying? And in particular, since much of the work had been done in the adult brain, the question is what they might be doing during development, right? So one of the things we now appreciate uh, that they're surveying are synapses. So if we overlay neurons, in this case, a neuron, this particular neuron was labeled with a Thi1 uh, RFP. So you can see the red spines. These are the synapses here overlaid, touching the microglia. This is a movie taken by my graduate student, Janelle, in vivo imaging, an awake behaving mouse, actually, in this case. Now you can see that one of the things they're constantly sampling and surveying are the synapses, the connections between two neurons, right? They're doing this all the time, very dynamically, and we also appreciate that they can respond to local changes, even changes in the, in the context of firing. So if a neuron is firing more, the microglia know. They can recruit themselves and touch synapses differently depending upon whether they're more active or not. This raises all kinds of possibilities for what these cells might be doing in the context of normal development. And that led us to wonder, could they be remodeling or pruning synapses during development? So what I want to do is tell you a bit about uh, how, we, uh, how we learned about this and, and the kinds of experiments we set up to test the hypothesis that microglia are sculpting circuits, sculpting synapses, and how they're doing it. And then I'm going to segue into implications for, for disease. OK, so one of the things we appreciated when we looked during development now, from the time the animal was born until about the second or third postnatal week, uh, is that the microglia are undergoing dramatic changes. If you just stain the brain with microglia markers like this or use that reporter line, you can hopefully appreciate that they are dramatically changing their shape and their morphology. And if you then overlay um, markers like L CD68, which, which actually uh, looks at their phagocytic capacity, their lysosomal activity, what we also appreciated was that they were more phagocytic during this early phase in the development in times and places that were um, happening during pruning. So in windows of pruning, different parts of the brain prune at different times. And in parts of the brain, like the visual system, that were undergoing robust remodeling, microglia were particularly phagocytic. And that led us to ask, well, are, are they actually sculpting or engulfing these synapses? So to address this, we moved to the mouse visual system, which is a really, uh, really terrific model for studying synaptic pruning and synapse elimination. Um, one can look at the synapse between the retina, the retinal ganglion cells in the retina that project to the visual thalamus, the dorsolateral geniculate nucleus, the relay, 
and the relay neurons in the visual thalamus. This just shows that if you put dyes in the, in the eyes of mice, red and, and blue, you can watch where their projections go. And that uh, image I showed you earlier was a zoom in of one neuron that happens to be right there. And that shows that early on, uh, postsynaptic cells innervated by axons from both eyes, shown here, but by maturity, you can see that there's a clear elimination of one eye input and a strengthening of the correct eye input. So that's actually pruning of eye-specific inputs. And we knew when and where this happened, thanks to the work of Carla Mason and Carla Schatz and many others. But now we wanted to overlay that with our tools to study microglia. And so that's where Dory came in, my first postdoc. Fortunately for me, I recruited her to my lab. She's very clever, and she came up with a way to test the idea. We knew that the microglia here in green were interacting and touching the inputs from the two eyes, right? So they're touching all these little puncta. These are the endings of the retinal ganglion cell inputs. And what Dory asked is, well, OK, they're touching them, but are they actually eating them? Are they engulfing them? And so to get at that question, she labeled the inputs like, like I just showed you. And then she used that reporter line and said, well, if they're engulfing them, we should see bits of those red and blue puncta within the lysosomes, within their bellies and processes. And pretty much what she showed is almost every microglia we surveyed throughout the visual thalamus was full of synaptic inputs from both eyes. And this was quite robust and reproducible. But importantly, um, what they seem to be nibbling, by the way, is the presynaptic terminals. Um, they're like basically plucking off the endings of the, of the axons where the presynaptic elements are. But importantly and quite relevant for what I'll talk about in the second part, which is uh, re relevance to disease, is that this is a tightly regulated process. It's not happening all the time. It's happening in these windows of development. And in particular, in this uh, part of the brain, this eye-specific segregation or pruning is happening between about postnatal day 5 and 10. We see a lot of microglia engulfment then. And then they really diminish and decrease their capacity to do this after that. We've since gone on and identified a second window of pruning that happens when the eyes open and when the feedback from the cortex is coming in. And we actually think from the work of our lab and now many others that there are multiple windows of microglia pruning that are happening in different parts of the brain. And there are windows in critical periods. They don't happen, they're happening in a very precise way, raising many questions about the mechanisms. Now, around the same time we uh, uh, made this discovery, another group um, uh, from Cornelius Gross's lab made a very similar observation in the hippocampus. So this says that it's not just the visual system. This is the model that we use, but it seems to be happening in other brain regions. They use a different mouse, this fractalkine receptor knockout mouse, which is a receptor that's only on microglia. And when they looked in mice that don't have this receptor, they noticed two interesting things. There are about half as many microglia in the brain, for reasons unknown, actually, during development. And one consequence of that is that you saw um, too many, sort of a lack of pruning. Uh, so you, ha you had a decrease, or you had a difference in, this, in the number of spines and synapses. Their maturation defects were happening. And importantly, and quite interestingly, when they looked in another study, there was actually evidence of a uh, weaker functional connectivity, not just in the hippocampus, but in the connections between the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. They actually were um, essentially you know, hypo-wired or, or less functionally connected. Now, this is based on sort of fMRI bold imaging, which is, I think, intriguing. We don't understand it yet. But it's evidence that if you mess around with something in the microglia and their ability to interact with synapses, one of the consequences of that is that the functional connectivity in the brain, at least in a mouse, is different. And I think that has some relevance and, and significance for, for the way we're thinking about this in terms of um, their contribution to brain, to brain wiring. Now, what are the mechanisms? So it's one thing to say that they're there at the right time in the right place. We have evidence that they're engulfing synapses. How are they doing this? And this brings us back to the same question I started with at the beginning, was we really want to know what makes the red synapse maybe different molecularly from the blue one. Could there be molecules or cues that tell the microglia, engulf me, the red one, the blue one, but do not engulf me, the red one? So this brought to bear uh, work I did as a postdoc in Ben Barris's lab, where we unexpectedly, in, through an unbiased screen initially, we identified um, a role for a group of molecules called complement, which are molecules traditionally associated with the, um, with the innate immune system. And this was a surprising finding back then, because these molecules really weren't thought to be playing a role in the healthy developing brain. But lo and behold, we found that the molecule called C1Q, which I'm going to tell you more about in a minute, 
This is the initiating protein of the classical complement cascade. And we show this, this, this protein at both the mRNA and the protein level was very highly expressed in subsets of those retinal neurons. These are the neurons that are getting pruned during peaks of pruning, so during the time that this pruning is happening. And that when we knocked out C1Q globally, right, these are C1Q knockout mice or C3 knockout mice, which is a downstream complement molecule, these mice fail to prune properly. They, they fail to segregate into these I-specific territories, and they remained multiply innervated throughout, actually, throughout life. And even if you look at an adult mouse, they have too many synapses. So that told us that this group of molecule was somehow involved in pruning, but we really had no clue about how this could work, because there was very little known about the role of these molecules in the brain. Now, interestingly, Carla Schatz's lab had shown a number of years before that another group of immune molecules called MHC class 1, this is more classically thought of in relation to adaptive immunity, she also showed a group of these molecules involved in pruning in the same system. She also found MHC class 1 through an unbiased screen. And um, interestingly, mice that lack MHC have a very strikingly similar phenotype to these guys. Now, work that Carla and I are now uh, thinking about doing collaboratively is going to ask whether our molecules could be interacting on cell level. So we don't have an answer to that. But it is an example of how molecules that we traditionally think of as of immune molecules, they are actually in the brain, and they seem to be playing an important role in pruning and developmental uh, refinement. So how could this really be working, right? So what was um, intriguing about complement, unlike the MHC and some of the other immune molecules that are in our brain, was these, these are actually a group of secreted immune molecules, right? And so their main role in the immune system is to tag apoptotic cells or, or bacterial cell for rapid removal. It's our first line of defense against an, effect, an infection in the periphery. So before your slower adaptive immunity kicks in, complement comes in. And one of the things it does is it binds to, let's say, that bacterial cell. Once it binds, that activates this proteolytic cascade that leads to the cleavage and the downstream activation, like a domino effect, of all the other complement molecules downstream. And one of the ways that complement removes or eliminates that cell in the immune system is that it tags it, C3 tags it for removal. And one of the key ways it gets removed is by those circulating macrophages that have receptors for complement. And that's one of the ways that it gets actually engulfed. So we started thinking about, could, in the brain, complements mark or tag subsets of synapses during development for removal by microglia that we now know also have receptors for complement? So this led to this idea that maybe in the, in the brain, the brain was co-opting this system, but in a very different way. Um, and so in, in the, the hypothesis is that complement molecules were binding to subsets of immature synapses, perhaps the less active synapses, and that that could be initiating uh, and telling the microglia to engulf those synapses. Indeed, when we looked in mice that lacked the receptor on the microglia, so we got rid of that uh, genetically, or the actual tags themselves, the complement molecules, no longer were microglia as efficient at engulfing synapses. And, and importantly, and I think also something we're thinking more about in terms of the, the functional and behavioral consequences of this, if you look in multiple parts of the brain, even in the adult mouse that lack complement, they have uh, sustained defects in this pruning. They have too many inputs in many parts of the brain, including cortex. And one of the um, outcomes of that is a hyperconnectivity. And it turns out that David Prince's lab, for example, looked at our C1Q knockout mice and did EEG recordings. And he, 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 he studies epilepsy. And indeed, when he looked, these mice were having absence seizures. And essentially, that was one of the consequences that may be a, a, related to the fact that these, uh, too many of these synapses were there because of a failure to prune. And so now work in the lab using much more specific approaches where we can knock out complement, not just everywhere in the body, but only in certain cell types in different times and places. We're now running these mice through a battery of functional and behavioral tests to ask the question, which I, in my mind we still don't know the answer to, which is what are the functional consequences of too much pruning? What are the functional consequences of not enough pruning? And at least in the mouse, we have a way now because we have a pathway we can manipulate to start to ask that, not just globally, but at a circuit level. And that's some of the work that we're, that we're now moving towards doing. OK. So one more thing I want to do, thinking about mechanism, I want to take you through the way we're thinking about this. Because we certainly haven't solved all this yet. We're sort of, in, in a way, at the beginning of our understanding. But we now that we've identified these molecules and these cells, 
Now we can start to think about how this is working. And I would argue that understanding this quite deeply is going to be, I think, quite important for understanding how this may go awry in a variety of neurological and neurodegenerative diseases. So if we can understand how this normally works, this might provide novel and new insight into how to protect synapses when there's uh, aberrant synaptic pruning. So one of the things I told you at the beginning is that synaptic pruning isn't a random process, and it's activity dependent. Remember, the, the less active or the inputs that are less efficient at firing the postsynaptic cell preferentially get lost in many of these models. We wondered, could microglia be preferentially engulfing the less active input, right? And so we actually uh, had uh, the ability to ask that question again in the visual system because we can manipulate activity in the eyes of a mouse. You can block activity in one eye with tetrodotoxin, for example, and you can um, increase the activity of the other eye. And using this model, because we had a readout, which was engulfment, we could ask the question, do microglia preferentially engulf inputs from the less active eye versus the stronger eye. And what we showed was in both cases, when we'd manipulated in different ways, there was a preferential engulfment of the less active eye input. And that suggests that the microglia know it's less active somehow. There must be some way they know that it's not as, as, as strong. And that raises this question of molecules again. And so we did an experiment, this is unpublished, where we basically did that same activity-dependent competition experiment, but we did it in our complement knockout mice, our C1Q knockout mice. And when we get rid of complement, remember that's the initiating signal that we discovered initially that got us into all this, when you look in mice that don't have C1Q, microglia no longer care. They don't go for the weak one. They don't have the preference at all. So that's a hint that somehow complement is regulated by activity, and maybe this could explain the selectivity. And this is the way we're envisioning this. And this is two models that I'm going to tell you about that we're um, exploring and investigating. And I would say these models are not mutually exclusive. So one idea is that complement molecules, C1Q, C3, and all of the components of the cascade, which we now have evidence are there in the brain during this, this window. One idea is, uh, by virtue of the fact that these are secreted molecules, that they could be selectively tagging subsets of synapses. And we predict the less active input based on some of our, our preliminary and, and, and other data. So that model is attractive. Um, and it suggests that there must be some receptor or molecules on those synapses that bring complement to it. So we're, of course, very interested in identifying what those molecules are. What are the complement receptors? So under that condition, anything that has complement on it, and if microglia are surveying and they have the receptors, anywhere where complement is, they will recognize and engulf it. So I think that model, while we have data to support it, is far too simplistic, because never does it work like that. It never works so simply. Um, so the other model uh, that I think is working in concert with the tagging model is this protective model. And that model suggests the following, that yes, you have complement, and it could be selectively binding to specific synapses, but maybe you also have a group of protective molecules that are shielding or protecting those inputs, let's say the stronger ones that, are more, that you want to keep, that it's the synapse that would lack the protection but would have the complement in this model that would get removed. And we now have evidence that I'm not going to have time to tell you about today, but just to give you a sense of the way we're, we're thinking about this, Emily Lehrman in my lab discovered a role for a group of, of molecules called CD47, again an immune molecule. And in the immune system, this molecule is considered what they call a don't eat me signal. These are molecules that protect our cells, our healthy cells from being randomly eliminated by macrophages. These are molecules that protect um, self versus non-self cells from being removed. There's a bunch of these molecules, and CD47 came to the top of our list because it's always also enriched in our retinal ganglion cells and in neurons during development. And what Emily showed is if you get rid of that molecule, microglia overeat. They eat too many synapses, and it has the complete opposite phenotype as the complement knockout mice. So this is an attractive idea because it suggests, also because microglia have the receptors that recognize that, that it's sort of like this molecular code and that there are groups of these molecules like complement that work together with these protective signals. And this is attractive also because it might explain why microglia don't keep eating the entire process or the whole cell. What stops them from doing that? And these molecules, the CD47, is everywhere on the cell. And we have evidence now that it gets selectively downregulated just on parts of the cell. And that might explain how they can recognize and prune specific cells and specific parts of the cell. 
So this is work in progress, um, but I think um, b between the two signals, that the t to us, it, it sort of gives us a way of conceptually thinking about how especially secreted immune molecules could be doing something as precise as pruning. So what I've told you is um, we've identified this pathway, this complement and microglia pruning pathway, and, um, and by no uh, means is this the only way that we prune synapses. There's many other molecules. I mentioned a few already, but we've identified this, this particular pathway, and we've been working hard to understand how it's working. But I think what's important to note is that this pathway is tightly regulated. And just like the immune system, these molecules are tightly regulated. When they're there, when they're on, when they're off, there are breaks on the system. And we think that those breaks are as important as the signals that turn it on. And that if you don't have the breaks in place, or if you have things that increase its expression or its activation, this could have important consequences for brain development. Because normally this thing gets turned down, you'd want to have sort of these pruning mechanisms down-regulated during the healthy, mature brain, at least in most parts of the brain. But what if all of a sudden this pathway becomes aberrantly activated or too much pruning is going on? This might uh, uh, underlie or contribute to um, uh, br brain connectivity and synaptic connectivity de defects in, in diseases and disorders like schizophrenia, autism, and epilepsy. So we've been thinking a lot about this. and and. And I'm going to tell you now evidence um, that it implicates our pruning pathway in schizophrenia. And I'm also going to end the talk with some potential ideas about how this may be relevant to autism, although we're really quite early in, in this process. But I think the work in the schizophrenia and the work we've done in development are informing um, experiments to start to think about how we might try to connect these ideas. OK. So schizophrenia um, is obviously a, a devastating neuropsychiatric disorder. Uh, it has uh, a number of features that are quite distinct from autism, and one of the things that I think is clear is the age of onset is quite different. Often it's adolescent, you know, late, late, uh, late ad adolescence is where you often get onset of schizophrenia. Now, there are several lines of evidence uh, that suggest synaptic pruning or synaptic loss might be happening in schizophrenia. But um, this uh, probably, this is the example we all show. This is work from David Lewis's lab that shows in the prefrontal cortex of some individuals with schizophrenia, there's a marked decrease in synapses in those dendritic spines as shown here. There's a sparsity of spines. And quite intriguingly, not everywhere in the brain, but in the frontal cortex, which is our association cortex in, involved in executive function. And, and that's led to all kinds of theories about pruning in, in schizophrenia. And I would say that these are interesting ideas but it's very hard to say that a loss of synapses or spines is really a pruning problem. And that is because by the time you get these brain autopsy samples, you don't know what happened, when it happened, if it's lost, never formed, if it's cause versus consequence, is it really pruning, is it degeneration? We just don't know. And it's one of the reasons why we've had a hard time trying to test this hypothesis because there also are no good animal models to get at this question. So, there's also evidence, though, to support a cortical uh, a pruning idea or hypothesis in that human imaging, brain imaging studies, have also shown evidence of a cortical thinning in patients that later go on to um, present and, 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 um, and, and become uh, schizophrenia. Uh, actually, this is happening even before the onset in this prodromal stage. Again, an intriguing observation, but is it really pruning? All right, we still don't know. So this is where human genetics can be uh, extremely useful. Um, so in the next few slides, I'd like to share uh, some very new and exciting um, now recently published findings by my colleagues and collaborator Steve McCarroll and his graduate student Ashwin Sagar, who have been using human genetics uh, to try to identify mechanisms and novel pathways for, uh, for intervention. OK, so a potential clue uh, for, for schizophrenia um, was hypothesized to involve uh, schizophrenia's strong association with genetic uh, uh, markers across parts of the human genome on chromosome 6. In particular, uh, a part of that uh, 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 chromosome called the major histocompatibility complex, or MHC. So it's been known that this MHC locus is what, for common variants, is a whopping effect on schizophrenia risk, right? Almost twice as strong in this Manhattan plot as the next strongest signal in any other chromosome. It's been known for a very long time. So you know kind of where, but the big challenge has been which gene? There's been no one gene identified or genes identified that, that, that explain this risk. And this region, if you zoom in on it, actually spans hundreds of genes, 
And interestingly, many of them include uh, uh, proteins that are traditionally associated with the immune system, both adaptive and innate immunity. And so this has inspired all kinds of theories about an immunological cause or, or, of, of schizophrenia. Uh, and it's been very hard to tackle uh, because it's been really a very intractable problem due to the complexity and the fact that really it doesn't follow any mathematical or statistical patterns that it can explain any known variants. So it's been this sort of no one knows what to do with it and no one wants to go there because it's too complex. So this is where um, Ashwin, who is a graduate student with Steve, decided to um, not be uh, daunted by that and to try to dig in and start to think about you know, what could explain this, right? And so basically, Steve and, and Ashwin had been studying uh, uh, extreme forms of structural genomic variation that could explain risk. And it turns out that in the MHC, if you zoom in, it actually contains um, uh, two genes, C4A and C4B. So this is the complement gene that's right in the smack dab in the middle of the pathway I just told you about in part one. Um, they had been noticing that the locus here contains two C4 genes, but there are many different alleles. And we sort of knew that from the immunologists, like Mike Carroll and others have been studying that in the context of the, of the immune system. But what Ashwin discovered is that this uh, locus contains remarkable structural variation. Some people's genomes, for example, have multiple copies of C4A, some have multiple copies of B, some have one but not the other, and some have both. So the haplotype is way more complex than they thought before. There are many different alleles in humans. And this raised the possibility that, in the hypothesis that Ashwin raised, because C4 is situated next to one of the strongest genetic uh, signals, could the structural variation or the form of C4 help explain the risk? And in particular, the other reason is because C4 is actually really important in regulating the activation of the complement cascade. If you get rid of C4, even if you have tons of C1Q, that cascade cannot go on. So it's actually a very important uh, process, uh, molecule in the, in, in the regulation of complement. So does variation of C4, could that be underlying um, schizophrenia risk? And so the challenge, though, although uh, Ashwin had developed these really uh, novel techniques to measure the structural variation in tens of thousands of individuals based on their DNA, the problem was how do you get at this and link it to schizophrenia? So what Ashwin and Steve did is they developed a novel way to map how the structural variation of C4, how the C4 structure, relates to SNPs for which there was already data available from tens of thousands of patients, right? So they built a map, essentially, to infer the four most common forms of C4. So there was lots of structural forms, but these are the most common ones. They wanted to know how the most common forms of C4 related to the, the SNP data that was surrounding the gene. So they essentially created these molecular barcodes from the SNP data. And it works because humans share long genomic segments that then they have inherited from their common ancestors. And this map then allowed them to take advantage of the fact that the SNP data was available from 28,000 schizophrenia patients and 34,000 controls in 34 countries. So now they actually could expand this and use the power uh, of big data to try to test this idea. And I'm going to now summarize in a very uh, one slide, which is a very uh, unfortunate thing to do considering how much work went into this. And this was recently published, so I encourage you to, to read the paper. But what they found is that the alleles of C4 appear to uh, shape the risk of schizophrenia in proportion to their effect on C4A expression. And so on the left, what I'm plotting is um, the allele's risk, right? So these are four alleles. And in its relevant risk to schizophrenia, and what you can see is that regardless of the MHC haplotype, those that have more A have an increased risk. It's very clear. And even more interestingly, on the right, what I'm showing you is each allele's effect on C4A expression, which they were also able to measure in a number of patients and samples. And what they show is if essentially A is related to how much A or C4A you make, so the higher the A, expression increased risk as well. So now the important point from all this is that the more C4A you make from the locus, the, more, the greater the risk you have of developing schizophrenia. So this is it was a huge genetic finding because it identifies one of the genes, or the most significant uh, gene within that locus that could explain uh, that signal. But it leaves many questions about how a C4A, whether you have more A or B, how could that relate to schizophrenia in terms of biology?
how does elevated C4 contribute to the pathobiology of schizophrenia? This is the question where we kind of come in, in terms of you really now just need to start to think about the biology. Like what do we know about complement? And what do we know about complement in the brain? And that's where um, a really fantastic collaboration between Steve's lab, my lab that's been studying complement and pruning, and Mike Carroll's lab who's been studying C4 and in the immune system for his career. Um, all of our labs started coming together. We're all local at Harvard. And uh, it was a ex great example of how multidisciplinary collaboration from investigators that probably normally wouldn't sit around the same table together, we started bringing our labs together, having uh, weekly lab meetings, and it's led to a whole new line of investigation and that we're really only in the beginning of our, uh, of our understanding of how this is working. But I want to share with you some of the data and also where we're going with this. One of the first things we did is we asked, where is C4 protein? I've told you everything about the message and the transcript. What about the protein? Well, we have really good antibodies for C4, um, and we can then take advantage of the fact that we have brain bank tissue from the Stanley Center and other, other sources. And we could just basically ask, where is C4 in the brain? And we got um, a small cohort of schizophrenia versus controlled brain samples, and we just stained the brains for C4. And what we showed is that, in, uh, that much like what we observed in the developing mouse brain, C4 is quite punctate, and it was localizing to synaptic uh, elements, synaptic, other synaptic proteins, in certain brain regions, like the hippocampus. Um, and this just told us, you know, we didn't do an extensive analysis to ask, do schizophrenia patients have more C4 in their synapses? We're doing that kind of larger scale thing now. But it told us that the C4 protein was there, and it was localizing to subsets of synapses in the human brain. And in, in parallel to that, um, what we did, um, Heather de Rivera in Steve's lab grew human um, uh, primary um, cortical neurons and let them develop and make synapses and then stain those neurons for C4 and also showed a localization of C4 to synaptic structures shown here by labeling pre- and post-synaptic markers, TAGMAN and PSD95. So again, in a human neuron, at least in a dish, we saw a complement going to synapses, especially as that neuron matured. And quite interestingly, you can then, um, these are almost pure neuronal cultures. You could also measure C4 from the um, conditioned media. So the neurons were actually secreting it as well. OK, so complement C4 is there. It's at synapses, at least in these conditions. Does it actually contribute or have anything to do with pruning? So we um, then went back to the mouse, right? So everything I just told you is human data. Now we're going to the mouse, because at least in the mouse, we have models for studying pruning. And we went back to our favorite model system, the retinogeniculate system, and we collaborated with Mike Carroll again and my, my former uh, graduate student who's now a postdoc in Mike's lab, where we basically carried out the same kind of um, eye-specific segregation pruning experiments in the mouse in mice that lack C4, so C4 knockout mice, and basically asked, are the mice that don't have C4, do they have defects in pruning? And what we found is that much like the C1Q and the C3 knockout mice that we'd already shown, the C4 knockout mice also exhibit these pruning defects um, that actually phenocopy the C1Q and the C3 knockout mice, and that C4 was made uh, by other cells, but also made by those retinal ganglion cells, the cells that are getting pruned, especially during development. And when we did our eye-specific segregation or our pruning assays, we basically showed that mice that lack C4 don't prune properly. They don't segregate into these nice eye-specific territories. And it looked a lot like our C1Q and our C3 knockout mice. So that puts C4 right in our pathway. It's providing more evidence that the whole pathway is activated, much like it might be in the immune system. All these components are in the brain. And at least during this window of pruning, they're working together to regulate this pruning process, at least in the mouse. But as you're probably thinking to yourself, OK, it's a mouse, and you're showing getting rid of something like C4, um, has pruning defects, how does this in any way relate to schizophrenia, to spine loss in the prefrontal cortex, to the pathobiology of the disease? Well, that's the hard part, and that's where we have um, to work together moving forward to try to get at this idea and to try to test the hypothesis that C4A may lead to an overactivation of the complement cascade, so having too much of a good thing, and that, that that might contribute to synaptic loss or synaptic connectivity defects in schizophrenia, right? And the challenge of testing this hypothesis is that we do not have mouse models of schizophrenia. We do not have um, mice that have prefrontal cortex that, do, that resemble uh, our human prefrontal cortex. There's a lot of issues here. 
But what I would say is that since the genetics have pointed us to this pathway, and since we know a lot about its biology, we're pretty well positioned to start to ask questions and start to test parts of this hypothesis. And that's going to involve getting into this question of why A versus B? For example, why doesn't B do this? Why is it A? They're so similar. They only, they only differ by just a, a, few, a few base pairs. Why? And in the immune system, we know that A and B might bind different things, so that's a clue. But how do we even begin to get at that? For example, we talked about the visual system. We really want to start moving our studies into areas more relevant to schizophrenia, like the prefrontal cortex, like the hippocampus. So my lab is now um, moving up <laughs> to those regions of the brain. And uh, actually, it's, it's, it's a bit daunting because there's been so little done on refinement and pruning in the frontal cortex. And um, before we can do these experiments, we have to do a lot of groundwork. We have to essentially try to do and map pruning and refinement in that part of the brain in the mouse. And I don't think anyone's really, unfortunately, done that yet. And so now we're, we're getting that groundwork laid. And then we're using the genetics to then um, make mice that are sort of humanized mice, if you will, that overexpress or underexpress the variant A versus B. And then what you can do, and Mike Carroll's made these mice, and we're working together on this, um, you can basically overexpress multiple copies of A, the human form, in a mouse, or you can do the same with B. And then you can use this to ask what the consequences are for pruning. You can do it in a global setting which is what the, the mice that Mike has made. Or what we're also going to do in parallel with that is we're going to use viral approaches to overexpress in circuits of interest at particular points in development, like adolescent period, and then ask if too much A in vulnerable circuits leads to pruning and what the consequences are, not just in terms of the number of spines, but how the connectivity and the behavior might be affected. So we're just beginning these experiments. But as you can imagine, there's lots to do. Um, and a lot of questions that have now come to the top of my list of things that I want to focus on for the next decade or more. Uh, and that brings us back to this question of like timing and onset of schizophrenia, which has always been really intriguing. Why does it happen in adolescence, right? And one of the things that I think is really interesting is the frontal cortex is one of the last areas of your brain to develop and to prune and to mature. So one idea is that the reason why you have um, this later onset is that that critical period just happens to be later than the visual system and the other sensory systems that prune much earlier. That's one idea. Um, it's certainly not the only hypothesis. But the other idea might be that pruning could become too intense um, in some people for various reasons. It could be a combination of genetic risk paired with another hit, like an environmental hit, for example. Could this pruning? then be subtle, but then expose other pre-existing vulnerabilities. Like This is something that we can start to think about with these double hit models now that we have the genetics behind us. And so I think in the end of the day, as I read more and more about adolescence and how little we know about what's happening in the adolescent brain, and I just feel like this is a hugely understudied area. It's also quite relevant to autism. And so that's one of the areas that we want to really try to move forward. And we hope that this might help us to develop better models of schizophrenia that can allow us to get at some of these questions. Now, I'm going to end the last few uh, minutes um, with um, speculations about how this might be relevant to autism. And in no way am I going to convince you or tell you that we've got this worked out in any way, except to say um, this is how we're thinking about it. And I'm going to tell you about some intriguing evidence that implicates microglia in autism but there are so many questions that we don't know. There are a lot of gaps. Um, and, um, and so the first thing I will say is that unlike the, the genetics are not pointing to microglia or, or our immune molecules, at least thus far. Now, it's not to say there's not a genetic link, but at least based on what we know, I don't think, unless Lou has some hidden information that I don't know, I don't think there's any microglia genes that have been rising to the list of significance. I think that's fair to say. But there is evidence that microglia are different or abnormal in some individuals with autism. And it's been looked at not just in one study or one way, but in multiple ways. And I want to tell you about those. But even still, what we don't yet know, and I think it's fundamentally important to understand, is, is this cause or is this effect? Could the microglia have some more proactive role in the process? Or are they simply responding to something else? And then they're sort of downstream, or could it be both? Like We just don't understand. And um, that's in part because we don't know how to study this yet. right? So here's what we do know that I think is intriguing data, especially when, when put together. 
No, there has been some um, transcriptional profiling work done by initially Dan Geshman's lab and now others where they've looked in human autism and they've profiled transcriptionally different brain regions from individuals with autism versus um, healthy controls. And there's been a number of genes at the transcriptional level that change and you can do all kinds of analysis to kind of get a sense of what the pathways are that are different. And what he's shown using these approaches is that there are several modules of genes that change that kind of give hints to terms of like pathways. Synaptic genes certainly are implicated both genetically and through the transcriptional studies. But the other thing that his data revealed, this was a number of years ago, was a couple of modules that go up. So a lot of the synaptic genes that are important for synaptic function are down-regulated in autism, but a lot of the immune-related genes were up-regulated in some individuals with autism. So this was intriguing. Didn't really explain anything, but it was an intriguing observation. Um, and another study came out and showed a very similar thing using an RNA-seq analysis. Also showed not only the same immune molecules that, that Dan had previously shown, but even more refined a group of modules that were really honed in on microglia, microglia in, in various different contexts. So this was an intriguing uh, piece of data, uh, but again, we don't know yet what this means. The other thing that's intriguing is that there were some PET imaging studies done. This was one study in particular where they used this PET ligand, this PK119. It's a TSPO ligand. It is not specific for microglia. I would say it's more of a, a ligand for uh, neuroinflammation. But they did a small cohort of, uh, of young adolescents with autism versus uh, non. They did this um, brain imaging, and they showed more of a signal of this, of this uh, PET ligand in individuals with autism, autism versus control. And so that was, again, intriguing, but by no way it means, says microglia are, are mediating any of this or involved. And there's been a number of studies, actually, on the pathological side in immunohistochemical analysis, where if you look uh, at microglia, they look different. They look more angry, activated. There's more of them in certain brain regions, again, just shown here. Intriguing, but we don't know what it means. So this is the question I'm going to sort of end with and sort of I'm going to tell you a little bit about the way we're thinking about it based on um, what we know uh, from our work in the lab. So the question I'd like to be able to address, and I think the field needs to be thinking about a bit, is how do microglia contribute at all to the pathobiology of autism? If so, how? And I think most importantly, when? Like, what, when could this be happening? And as I told you today, microglia are in contrast to the way we used to think about them, are intimately associated with neurons and other glial cells. They're actively helping to sculpt the brain that's pruning. But we all know now, uh, not we don't all know, we now know uh, through, <laughs> I wish we all knew, but we don't all know, uh, that there's a number of other things microglia do that are relevant. Um, so pruning is probably the tip of the iceberg. There's evidence to suggest they're important in uh, synaptogenesis, pathfinding, other aspects of development that could be happening either, even as early as embryonic development. So this idea that they could be a more homeostatic physiological roles of microglia put them in a different context. So the way we're thinking about it is, you know, kind of two models that are not mutually exclusive. One is that, you know, the idea is that genetic and or environmental factors could alter microglia function in some way and influence brain development and ultimately synaptic connectivity. So one model is, and this is largely based on the genetics that we know thus far, is that genetics are pointing to neuronal genes and synaptic genes. We know there's a lot of evidence of neuronal and synaptic dysfunction. And you can imagine, based on the fact that I told you at the beginning, that the microglia are acutely sensitive to their environment. In this case, you can imagine a neuron that is um, essentially not functioning properly because of uh, a mutation in shank or, or another a, a, a gene that's been uh, linked to, to autism, that the microglia then would be responding aberrantly to that neuron that's either not firing properly or not behaving properly. And that that may be secondary, but you can also envision that no longer are microglia carrying out their homeostatic good roles, and that that could initiate some sort of feedback role in vulnerable circuits and brain regions that could then, in concert with the neurons, further contribute or exasperate the phenotypes. So this is something that we're actively studying in the lab. There's some evidence that we recently published in the context of Rett syndrome, where we showed in a mouse model of Rett syndrome, where you knock out MECP2, right, the gene that's been shown to be causal to Rett syndrome, if you knock that out everywhere, um, the microglia misbehave and they overeat synapses in the time uh, that corresponds to a synaptic regression. But we also showed in that, because we have genetic tools, that when we try to rescue just the microglia, 
they didn't, it didn't explain all the phenotypes. And if we knocked out MECP2 only in the microglia, it didn't cause phenotypes. So this uh, actually is consistent with now a number of uh, studies that are emerging that suggest that microglia could contribute, but they're not causal and they're not initiating the process. But that doesn't mean that if they're not behaving, that there's not important to be thinking about how to keep them in check. So that's one model. The other model, though, which I'm also, again, saying it's not mutually exclusive, is as I told you, microglia are part of the brain from the very beginning. There's more and more evidence to suggest that early development, embryonic development, is, is, is impaired in some way. And if microglia, through some genetic and or environmental insult, are then changed during this period of development, that could in many ways alter the way the brain develops. And this is just globally speaking. There's no molecule here. But it brings up this idea that if these cells are important in early development, even before pruning even happens, we need to be thinking about them and putting them into the equation a little bit more. And what we now know, since they enter the brain, in a mouse at least, very early embryonically, and we started looking at microglia in a very early embryonic brain versus a later one, you can see how different they look early in development. They're not everywhere. They're not tiling the brain. They increase in their numbers. They're, they're hanging out in different pockets in the brain. It's almost giving clues to what they might be doing during development. And the other thing we know is they're undergoing these dramatic changes in development and differentiation. We're just beginning to try to understand how that's working and what they're doing, but we know so little about how they're normally developing. And uh, we started collaborating with Steve McCarroll, and this is a safari-funded project, where we realized before we can ask what microglia are doing in autism models, we best understand what they're normally doing in development. And we better get a better handle on how they're developing and what makes a microglia a microglia. And also, instead of treating all microglia equal, it might be that microglia are, have unique sort of states, if you will, and we need to better understand what those states might be. So one of the ways we're doing that is we're applying a new technology, a uh, transformative new technology developed by Steve's lab, Steve McCarroll's lab called DropSeq, which is a single cell RNA sequencing technology that allows you to um, simultaneously genome-wide transcriptionally profile thousands of individual cells essentially allows you to digitally count the number of transcripts in each cell of each gene. It's pretty powerful. There's other uh, examples of RNA sequencing that are going on in this way. But we thought this would be a great way of getting at microglia development and microglia heterogeneity, both in normal development, and then compare that to uh, genetic models of autism and then different insults to see how microglia's development and states change over time. And the other reason why we thought it'd be powerful to do is because we don't have good markers for microglia. All we know is that they look different. But looking different doesn't tell you anything about their biology. We don't have a marker that says these are more phagocytic, these are dividing more, these are eating more synapses, these are not. We need to have a more a molecular fingerprint, if you will, so that we can then go into these brain samples and better understand what microglia might be doing in these contexts. So using DropSeq, this is just preliminary, we wanted to just ask, are all microglia the same and uniform all over the brain, or could they be in different states? Could there be different subsets, if you will, of the same cell type? And using DropSeq, what you can do is profile a purified population of microglia from different stages, and you can then ask, are they shaking out into different subsets? And so this is an example, a, a preliminary data unpublished, that just shows multiple different subsets of microglia states within the brain of an embryonic mouse. And when you look at what genes are enriched in these different subsets, we see clusters of genes that are indicative of what they're doing. So we can, for example, zoom in on this large subset versus a small subset and say, what genes do they make? I'm not going to get into the details. So this is just early days. But you can see there are some genes, like C1Q, that's made by all microglia, independent of their subset. But there are some subsets, like this guy, that's making a lot of IGF-1. And interestingly, when you go into the brain and you stain for IGF-1, IGF-1 isn't everywhere in the brain. It's in these little pockets, which is now allowing us to zoom in and ask what that might be doing. And we have other examples uh, where there's other markers that are telling us a bit more about what their biology might be doing. And now that we're getting that groundwork laid, we can then perturb the system, either genetically or environmentally, challenge the mouse, and then ask how, that, um, how those states change. And then ultimately, identify candidates that are different, and then be able to use genetics to knock out that candidate and see if we can protect some of the phenotypes. That's ultimately where we would like to be able to go with this. Um, so I just want to like, I want to end 
uh, now with just sort of the bigger picture and, and putting this in an even a larger framework outside of neurodevelopmental disorders because we've focused a lot on neurodevelopmental disorders today but um, there's also increasing evidence that synapse loss and dysfunction is a hallmark of a lot of uh, other disorders including neurodegenerative diseases and um, more and more evidence both from our lab and now other labs is suggesting that this good pruning pathway can also become aberrantly reactivated in neurodegenerative diseases of the aged brain including Alzheimer's, glaucoma, frontal temporal dementia, Huntington's, this is unpublished, and all of this together is suggesting the possibility that this may be some common pathway that is impacting pruning and synapse loss and that although different things may trigger the pathway once it's activated, it can be an important pathway in regulating synapse loss. And that also, we think, has important therapeutic implications because if we can figure out how to control this in, let's say, an Alzheimer's model, this might someday provide insight on how to control this in autism, schizophrenia, if we're right and if it is a similar pathway. And um, I don't have time to go through it, but just to say we recently published a paper that did show that this pruning pathway that normally regulates developmental pruning becomes aberrantly reactivated in Alzheimer's mouse models, not everywhere, but in vulnerable circuit like the hippocampus, and that when we knock out this pathway genetically or with an inhibitor, we could protect the synapses, and we actually have now new data from Cindy Lemire's lab that we can protect some of the cognitive function. And that leads us to the last uh, point, which we're thinking about now, is whether we can use this information to target uh, this pathway in various ways and whether we can use that to think about ways to develop strategies and novel therapeutics to protect synapses, or at least in, in the context of this pathway. And I and, uh, just want to highlight that Ben Barris and Arnon Rosenthal started a company in Exxon Biosciences, and they've generated a, a C1Q blocking antibody. And this antibody is a functional blocking antibody, so it basically binds to the, this, this part of the molecule. It prevents it from activating the cascade. And what we showed in, in our model, and it's now being looked at in other models as well, is that when we treat these Alzheimer's mice uh, during this window of pruning with this uh, blocking antibody, we could protect some of the synapses. Um, and so now we're, we're trying to think about ways we can um, utilize this information and develop even more specific inhibitors that will get into the brain and see if that might be a way to start thinking about targeting um, these pruning pathways. Um, so I just want to uh, end by thanking a lot of folks in the lab, both past and present, uh, really amazing collaborators that all began with Ben uh, when I was a postdoc in his lab, and we continue to collaborate. Lots of other collaborators I mentioned along the way. Obviously, generous funding, including uh, funding from Safari that's really allowed us to get going on the autism work and my lab, which I think is probably the most important acknowledgement because this is an amazing group of students and trainees that make everything uh, really work in my lab. So thanks so much.